But I think the main things is at the end of the day, volleyball is volleyball. It's in the same nine by nine court, and the rules are the same. So we. Uh, <laughs> Is that on the back of your shirt? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's on the back of your shirt. A little free shout out for you. Um, and it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the net. You need to still execute to the best of your ability if you want a chance to win. That's right, Brett Walsh. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. This is the 9x9, nine nine, the 81 square meters of the best volleyball coverage on the internet. It's episode 106. It is Tuesday, January 30th, 2024. My name is Rob St. Clair, live from a hotel room in Kansas City, Kansas. Kansas and that, City, Kansas. Right. And that is Everett DeLorme from his usual spot in Toronto, north of the border. Uh, yeah, weird show. I hope everything works okay on the, on our hotel Wi-Fi. But can we're you, here. Uh, can you give us a quick tour? Is it a one bed? Is it is it two uh, bed? Like what you, what you get? A, what you got over there? I got, is, I there got, is there is there a chair? There is a chair. I'm sitting on a nice, uh, like a decent office chair right now. Everyone knows chair, what like... that chair is. Everyone knows what that oh, chair is for. <laughs> yeah, I got two beds. I got actually a half decent view. It's a it's a surprisingly nice weather out in Kansas City, Kansas. So, yeah, whatever. I'm flying back to Chicago tomorrow, but uh, it wasn't going to stop us from doing the show. No, of course not. It, I mean, we've done. I've done shows from the wilderness. <laughs> yes, you Rob have. Saint Clair. So if yes, you can you figure it out to do it from a hotel room, then like, I don't know what to say. What what to say anymore? So yes, Ozzy, we are we are in Kansas, uh, Kansas City, um, Kansas City, Kansas. Though not Kansas City, Missouri, where Correct. Taylor Swift's Chiefs are uh, are about to embark on the super on the Super Bowl. Fortunately, again. Again, again, no, no, no Packers, unfortunately, this season. But uh, yes, yes, you guys had a pretty good season. But sorry, yeah, we're, we're we're getting we're getting off the topic here, Rob. Uh, let's talk about some volleyball. It was a huge let's weekend. Do it. Oh, it was a it was this like Rob. I think it's fair to say that this was an historic week in volleyball. Um, you okay? You, you, yeah, there, you, there there are some reasons for that. I, I'll I'll back you up on that one. There, there's some firsts over there. Some there are some records uh, being broken. But first and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, Perugia. Oh my goodness, they might be back. They they might be back. They pick up their second trophy of the season, uh, taking on the Supercopa, taking the final match three one against Monza. Uh, they beat Milano in five in the semifinals, and Monza with an epic five set win over Trentino in the semifinals. But Rob St. Clair, I messaged you on Saturday during the semifinals and Sunday during the finals twice, and I was saying there's flashes, there's flashes of it in the, uh, in the semifinals, some flashes of ugly stuff too. Uh, but there was flashes of Perugia looking like the best team in the world again uh, this weekend. And most notably, that was without Leon on the court. All he was doing in coming in and, you know, providing walk-off uh, service aces. Um, but Perugia coming home with the Supercopa trophy. Xerxes right there looking nice and nice and stoked, uh, nice and happy. But uh, the Block Devils do it again. They're back in business, baby. They are. Maybe they are. Yeah, they already grabbed the Super Cup at the beginning of the year. This is the Italian Cup that they won after last year. Remember last year with Perugia going undefeated in the regular season? It was at this tournament, at the Italian Cup last year, when they first showed their that 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 first crack appeared in the Perugia armor when they got when they lost to Piacenza in the, in last year's Italian Cup. And then we all know what happened after that, but six and six after a, a, after that point. That's right. But this this is this looks and feels a little bit different to me. It looked uh, it, it was very impressive. The final match, honestly, Perugia beat Monza three to one, like you said, wasn't even overwhelmingly good. Like Monza won the first no. set and then Monza just did not was not really a, a competitor against Perugia the following three sets the way that they were playing and uh the first person i want to shout out is not the mvp who is ole plotnitsky um, and i know we rag on this guy a lot for committing too many net violations but how about flavio man flavio flavio and sole really sold it down the middle for 100 uh, percent. like sole was sole was real big and i almost forgot that he was on this team like we just haven't seen him in a while uh but they brought him in in the semifinal especially to go head to head with lozare and you had to love that little argentinian matchup down the middle that was I, fun yeah yeah i i love that a lot it it it, it was great but uh I mean, there was a huge drop off. I mean, they were crushing it, and, and we were messaging it. I, I forget what the I forget what the lead was. I have eleven six in my head, but uh, of course, I 
freaking forgot my book again. Uh, this is the second weekend in, in, in a row that I <laughs> that I've that I've done that. I've been doing so much better at like keeping notes while I watch matches to remember it during the show, and I keep on forgetting my book elsewhere. Um, that, that might but, be the most Everett Delorm thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> I mean, you've you've hung out with me and know about, like that I am just like a walking hurricane at all times. Um, <laughs> But there was they were up massively in the fourth in the semifinals against Milano. Milano was able to come all the way back uh, and force that that fifth step at the end of the day. Like they were just too good uh, on both occasions. Plotnitsky was especially fantastic. He was so efficient all weekend long. Yeah, Ole um, was awesome the whole tournament. Uh, well, I I think that MVP was well deserved. There are some people in in the Discord who thought otherwise that. There were a couple other guys who should have gotten that. And we'll talk about the, the semifinals in a minute. But I want to focus on the final first because the the way that Monza got there was obviously very impressive. No, nobody in the world would have picked, including us. We were dead wrong. We yes, didn't think that Monza. We didn't think that Monza had a chance to beat Trentino, but they did. It would, it was, after that first set, Monza just really didn't have it. It was a great Canadian showing in the semis. The only good Canadian showing in the final was Arthur Schwartz, 19 for 32 for 22 points. But Eric Lepke and Stephen Marr were both not very good. No, both not the greatest good for uh, for either of the Canadian guys. I mean, Lepke was all right. He was 17 for 31 um, with no errors in the match. And I think Lepke overall, his passing wasn't fantastic. Um, but I think Lepke overall was really a huge bright spot for Monza, especially like We'll talk about it a, a little bit later, but Ran Takahashi went down with an injury in their in their league game earlier in the week. Lepke came off the bench and probably had his worst match of the season. Like it, it was ugly, and I he was not going anywhere near the Discord Discord after the way uh, Lepke played in in that one. <laughs> but he stepped up huge, and he was the MVP in, in the semis. Semis, right? And he was. Yeah. I, I still think that he was. He was pretty good. Like he had a few couple a couple, couple big blocks, uh, a couple of aces, and he was seventeen for thirty one. Like he was. And 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 he was and he was Monza's. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong stats. Yeah, right I now. think you're looking at the wrong game. Yeah, yeah, I nine for twenty four in the final with five yeah. errors for Lepke like that. That's yeah. not great. The the passing numbers were not great. But I mean, it's kind of a good summary of this, just the duality of Monza. They were they lost to Verona in five in the league on Wednesday. Then they beat Trentino out of literally nowhere. Played by far the best game of the season, and then they take a set off of Perugia and then they lay an egg after that. It's just kind of the, the up and down nature of this team. It wasn't even that they, they, they served the ball that poorly five aces, 10 errors in the finals, not bad at all, but there was just absolutely nothing they could do to stop Perugia. Uh, Bentara nope. was good. 16 points. Semenyuk was very good, led the match in scoring and the middles were really the thing for me. I think, what was it like the last f at least four, maybe five, maybe even six balls in a row from Simona Ginelli all went to Flavio in the middle. He just kept on feeding the middle. Mons is like, oh my God, he set the middle again? No way. How could I have ever expected this? Mm -hmm. And they just kept setting Flavio down the stretch and he never got stopped and that was kind of it. Yeah, I mean, as as I said, Perugia looked like the best team in the world, and at, at certain points this weekend, especially uh, like shout out to John the Master. Yeah, it was it was eight, sixteen to eight uh, in that fourth set, and Milano was able to to come back. Uh, That's and, crazy. And, and I mean, I was t I was literally texting you during it too, and I was just like, "Yeah, they're walking away with this one." And I'd be like, "Oh, never mind." Milano just somehow <laughs> it, it made me look so illegitimate as I'm texting you as as you're doing the, doing the VLA. But yeah, they looked so good. Let's they're let's talk about those games because I, I think like the the two semifinals were definitely better oh, matches and absolutely. had more drama. So let's talk absolutely. about Perugia versus Milano. Okay, yeah, but Perugia. Well, I was gonna. You, Okay, let's go Perugia versus Milano. I mean, this one, it was Milano wins the first. Perugia dominates the second and third, dominates the majority of the fourth. Milano somehow comes back. Um, and then Perugia was was real good uh, once again in the fifth. But they they still have these blips, you know, and especially against a team like M Milano who's who can, like, focus in on the details and, and be pretty good at times. Like, Perugia still has these blips where they're not as confident, but when they're rolling, like they are, they are so damn good. Oh yeah, that's that's the team that Gino Sirci built, and that was the intention all the way is to build the team that was just downright terrifying. And last year they were t they were actually more terrifying throughout mm -hmm. most of the year before uh, they crumbled mentally. Now they're 
their weaknesses are they they show up a little bit more often but their they their level doesn't dip nearly as much when those weaknesses do show up now i leading 16 to 8 in an elimination situation and losing that set is not good like yep. that that is that is not an acceptable run to give up but still like the the numbers here like it, it i don't really even understand how milano even took two sets cuz wasim bentar went 18 for 30 and Plotnitsky went 18 for 24. <laughs> like yeah. these, and uh, like the, the, the ace to error ratios are very similar. Uh, 14 blocks for Perugia versus seven for Milano. Like Perugia beat them in every statistical category. I don't really understand how Milano even took two sets and made a game out of this. Um, yeah, you're, you're very right. I mean, P Milano was pretty good at trying to limit uh, their errors. Um, but other than that, they were just plucky, getting good good points at good times also it is a little uh elevated from that 25 to 15 um little uh little th third set where perugia was just absolutely dominating um but you're right like this game from what i watched didn't feel like a five setter like the other one felt what felt like a five setter like it was back right. and forth and there's there was times where you know it looked like trentino was going to take it and then milano or monza came back in we'll talk about it in a second but this one didn't feel like a five setter like it it it, it truly didn't um yeah i'm i know what the key is you want to know what the key is to me everett for Perugia's success what's that you can look and see it in that photo right there on the screen clean shaven Ginelli. none Ooh. of that horrible horrible goatee i hate that goatee on Ginelli so much clean shaven Ginelli has superpowers clean and shaven G he looks like he got a nice bit of a haircut yeah um, he's looking good man he's a good he looking is... dude when he doesn't have that miserable goatee and i think that provides perugia with some superpowers yeah it's like evil Gianelli. now he's, he's coming <laughs> he's coming back from it a uh, voice check in in the chat saying is perugia really playing as one of the best teams in the world not sure is if you actually beaten milano two times three nothing absolutely i like I, I fully agree with that but when they were winning the way that they were doing it and the way that they were dominating was so all-consuming like it, it it's it and it was either on and off and i still think that they're finding that way to keep it on and on and now I think there, there's two questions. A, can that be consistent? Can 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 that be kept? But I think that's the Lorenzetti effect. Yep. You know, I, I think sure. that where he that's where he brings in that consistency. But secondary, can that be uh, consistent across the board, no matter who you have out there? Because right now it's working really well with Bentara. Bentara was fantastic uh, in in this semifinal. Bentara looking... is the guy. I've, I've been trying to tell you all. Okay, once so once good. again, I've never I've never doubted that that he was fantastic. I just didn't think that. Like to me, it's it's not an upgrade going from Ruchlicky to to Bentara. In in some ways it is, but you lose in other ways. And I mean, on this weekend, Ben Tar was the better guy. Rich Licky, I mean, Rich Licky was still pretty good. We'll talk about it in a second. But Ben Ben Tara was was fantastic. But like, can that work when you have Herrera in? And most importantly, can that work when Leon is in? It's a totally fair question. I'm curious to see how that looks and how Lorenzetti manages it. I mean, yeah, you have three world class outside hitters, three great middles, two good if not streaky opposites and uh the, that that creates some decision making situations for the coach but i completely agree with you it's we're not saying that peru is the best team in the world we're saying that when they play like that just like you said the 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 particular feeling or i would like to call it the, the flavor of domination mm -hmm. that you feel when perugia is in that zone is unlike any other team in the world even trentino at their best even yeah. like zaxa at their best Zaxa's over the last up, couple yeah. years you, if, uh, it's, it's, right they, now, it's who very you, reminiscent of Zenit Kazan at their height it's in the very it's that. very it's it's very reminiscent of Matt Anderson Mikhailov and Leon coming at you all at once um, yeah that's that's, that's a that's fantastic hard. comparison it's, and it's, it's not just, just Leon all consuming it's it, it's it's a lot so this is this is what I'm saying like this is a dangerous team moving forward especially when you start looking at the fact that this is a team with rest Right, this is a team that doesn't have to play European competitions. Isn't flying off to the the other country. All of their other opponents, like even Monza, has to play in the Challenge Cup. All of their other top opponents are all doing extra things, and their extra things are done. It's a good point. They already won the Club World Championship, which is a stupid tournament that nobody cares about. Exactly. And uh, so Perugia is now three for three on trophies, and there's only one more left that they can win.
And that's and, the uh, biggest one that, that's been eluding them as well. That's so absolutely that, that, that's, right. That's, that's a big one. Um, Rob, let's touch on the other semifinal real quick uh, between uh, Trentino and Vero, Vero Volley Canada. Um, <laughs> nice one. It, I mean, I stole that from someone in the in the Discord. Um, yeah, it was the Discord has been it was was popping off this 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 weekend. It, it it was a lot of fun. Um, this one was really good. I mean, we were on the doorstep of Trentino having a uh, a, a three one win, and then I think Rich Licky. So here was my breakdown uh, of it all. First and foremost, Eric Eric Lepke was fantastic. So was Arthur Schwartz. Like the Canadian trio was 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 good altogether. Rob, you've said time and time again this season that when Monza has a good serving game, they they play well, and they had a fantastic serving game. Six errors only, or sorry, six aces only. Uh, uh, 16 errors. Your boy got off three. Love to see it. Um, three and 19 on the other side uh, of the now for Trentino. Um, now, one of the biggest things in this match for me was Rich Lucky not being able to get it done in down the stretch. Like, especially in the fourth and the fifth, Rich Licky was not able to get it done. But to me, that was just a fatigue because Micheletto, and if you look at the numbers too, Micheletto and Lavio were not huge contributors in this one. And they were really, really solely on, like they were really focusing and putting all of that weight on that match on Rich Licky. And I've said time and time again, Rich Licky is not that type of player. He's not that type of opposite who's going to go out and consistently put a team on his back and and throw up 20 and, and, and 30 point games. He's a guy that works well with it within a system. Um, so it was that breakdown to me that really like, and, and don't get me wrong. Some of this was, was hundred percent brought on by a fantastic match all around uh, by Monza. They play a, such a good, strong team game and yes like Lepke had a match like great match Lepke had uh 21 Mar had 16 or sorry Schwartz had 16 Mar, Mar had had 13 and they, they were the, the the leaders for for Monza but man, don't, don't sleep on John Luca Galassi man 10 for 14 attacking three aces three blocks it's one of the best matches I've seen him play in a long time Galassi's legit man I think he's been real strong this year yeah like, I mean he's, he's awesome he's a national team starter but the like just the joke that we like to make that isn't so much of a joke because it's true is that he just loves more than anything in the, in the world to bury jump serves in the middle of the net that's just what he loves to do all the time so including, yeah, it's uh, either it's either in the middle of the net or the middle of the court so you know <laughs> it, it's scoring a point e- either way right terminal Which, <laughs> And like that's that's you can like to get that from a middle like you you absolutely love that right you, you absolutely absolutely love that but one hundred percent now I I want to talk about Rick Liskey for a minute because you're right you now you are higher on Camille Rick Liskey than I am but the the way that you described it is absolutely spot on he is not that guy to carry you down the stretch in a game and uh, Monza put him in a position where he had to try and be that guy, and he made a bunch of errors down the stretch. I mean, he went 18 for 42, like by far the most attempts on Trentino, and and, and made 12 errors, many of those in terrible times. And that's kind of been why I haven't always loved Camille Rogliski, because that's kind of what you need your opposite to do. The, 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 the great opposites do that. Rick Liskey is a guy who thrives in the right system, which is exactly why he's been so good on Trentino all year. Uh, you and I are closer on that debate than I think everybody thinks that we are. But yeah. this was this match is exactly what I think about Rick Liskey. He is a good opposite. If he's the second or third attempt getter on the team, great. That that you're in a good spot if that's the case. If he's the leading attempt getter by 13, that is not a recipe yeah. for success for Trentino. I don't mind him being the leading attempt getter, but it has to be a little bit closer. And I think that not only that, but you need to be getting a, a little bit more support. Because even though like Micheletto had a ba- had a bad game with four errors out there, 10 for, 10 for 29, like he was hitting 30 34% and his efficiency is way below that. Like Lavia yeah, about twenty percent like, efficiency. That that's not good enough. Both Lavia and Micheletto can't be hitting under four forty percent, right? Like that. That to me is 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 a big problem. So to me, it just seen all it was was sitting on the shoulders. And even then, like Zamerna wasn't was great in the middle either. Uh, six for fourteen. Um, and and who's there? Oh yeah, Podraskinin was was he was he was decent. He was he was five for nine. But like the numbers just weren't there for Trentino, and it, it was just a it was just a bit of a bad match. And I'm wondering if pe- people are starting to figure out Trentino 
a little bit. Well, I think the may, maybe a tiny bit, but I, I really think that Moan's a lot of the credit for this. Uh, by far the best match they've played all year. The, the the serving, like you said, is absolutely key for their success. And this is kind of the one thing that the last couple years was sort of this particular Trentino team and their identity. They haven't been that good of a reception team the last two or three years. Now, last year, they, they won a Scudetto anyway because Perugia got out of their way. And this year, they have been statistically much better in reception. But if you can serve that team off the court, uh, that is th- the most consistent way to beat Trentino. And uh, yeah. Which is why I, I would have really loved to see Trentino play Perugia this weekend because Perugia is the scariest serving team maybe on the planet. And I, I would have been curious to see how... like because Trentino is so good at, at establishing their play style and bending you to their will yeah. and, and all sure. that. But Perugia is, might be the team that's able to break them in, in serve receive. So uh, we didn't get to see that. It makes me want to see that matchup again down the road kind of for that reason. Yeah. I mean, on that, I mean, I, I think Perugia is so dangerous right now because they're so good in first ball side out. Like they're so efficient in, in, in just that first ball. Get it, get that ball back, and then when it's really clicking, their block defense is terrifying. Like oh, yeah. the fact that they're able to just batter you with servers like Ben Tara, Plotnitsky, and Semenyuk, yuck. Like even Gianelli has like a nasty serve, right? Like they can just come at, come at you, uh, and it, in in a certain way, like that's that's maybe. I think that may be one one of the, the 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 I think there's there's pluses and minuses when you go Lepke over over uh, Ran and Monza, but I think the serving on Lepke's side, like when it's in, it's a little bit stronger and, and a little bit better, and that's what kind of like when that team is serving, like they are they're they're one of the best serving teams in the world. That, absolutely, but when they're not, yeah, they're bad. <laughs> But uh, good for Monza. Though. This this was just really a massive win for them, and I'm I'm kind of bummed for them that they don't get like that that it doesn't help them climb ground in the regular season standings. No. You know, still it's so funny because they've been on this great run, and I mean, hey, to get to the finals, they beat Lube and Trentino, so like that's that's a run, and they're also willing in winning in the Challenge Cup but they're also currently on a five game skid in the regular season. So at least it injects a little bit of life. But they need to stop things. Uh, stop things in the regular season. Which, uh, so let's let's talk about the regular season while while we're in Italy, because uh, like I, I didn't even know this on last week's show, but you brought it up that we had a a Wednesday of Super League games, and there were a couple upsets here. Uh, we're not going to talk about Perugia or Trentino or Milano because we already did, but uh, we can talk about Verona Monza a bit. Also, what the hell is Lube Civitanova doing? What the hell is Piacenza doing? And what the hell is Modena doing? What a weird week for those three teams. I so like, we can start with Padova Modena because that I That's sat it. down and watched a, a Padova match for the for the first time this weekend, Rob St. Clair. And I won't lie, I was kind of I was kind of impressed. I I, I, I I was kind of digging it. How about like, Davide Gardini, man? The the pairing of Davide Gardini and Luca Poro. Luca Poro is nasty. Yeah, he's, he's gonna be awesome. He, he's nasty. The Poro brothers are the Italian Elsers. The Poro I, I like brothers, that because there's there's the, a third there's a third there's Poro a, that's even younger. The, I think Tommy there's a told third us. Poro. Yeah, he he's a, he's a setter. I was looking it up this weekend. They all have just fantastic touch. They've got fantastic volleyball send. They have like like they have perfect hand contact with these with these when he, they swing. Like I don't know if you guys if you saw that one highlight of Luca Poro bouncing the ball down the line from this weekend, but it was filthy. Like they are just volleyball players like down to their core. And like, they're so I wouldn't, Italian in the way that they play too in the best like possible I, way. I absolutely guarantee you they grew up playing on their knees in the bedroom in the living room like these guys have were always touching the ball playing the ball um but yeah gardini is starting to look all right like pretty decent if you don't let him better than all right this game 22 for 37 with only two errors like that's spectacular offensively he's he's really good offensively he's really good the issue is of course his pass reception um but it 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 doesn't really matter against Modena, to be honest. And like, they're a terrible team to watch. Like, I'm sorry to say, they they figure it out because they've got veteran guys. But like, Modena right now is that old guy at the YMCA who you don't 
exactly know is how it was getting buckets. He's still he's still in there. But like like their offense is so easy to read at this at this time. So they get into so many rallies. Like they're really not efficient in first ball side out. Uh but they just score old man points. And that's essentially what they are. They're a collection of old men with some young upstart, upstart like, you know, whippersappers. Like, it's, they're not a fun team to watch. I found myself, and Rob, let's be honest, there's, due to certain people in the Discord, we are all, we are very pro Modena in the Discord. Like, they, they seem to, because of, because of the prominence of certain Modena fans that we have in Discord, we all kind of like hop on their bandwagon. This was the first time that I found myself cheering against them, except for against Bloomberg last year. Yeah, speak for yourself. I, I've been cheering against Modena for a couple of years now, ever since like the, the last year that Micah Christensen was there. I haven't found Modena to be that likable, with the exception, obviously, of Daddy Stankovic, who is my hero and was uh, arguably the best player on, on Modena this particular game. Um, because even though Juan Terena had a good game offensively, he was a liability in serve reception. And uh, I, I again give credit to Vlad Daviskiba for doing a hard job because there are so many times this season for Modena when oh, I look at the stat man. sheet or watch a game that all of a sudden in the middle of the match, he's changing positions because. Sapochkov was not good enough at, on, at opposite. So Davi Skiba switched to the right side in the third set, brought in Tommaso Rinaldi, and he sucked. So, like, what, 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 what Rinaldi, are you supposed to do? I have to, I have to say this. Rinaldi is one of my biggest disappointments of this season, right? When I was – so coming and finishing last season with how I saw Rinaldi progress, I thought that he was probably one of the first guys off the bench for Italy. Uh, in that national team season, because you've got you've got that group of kind of number three guys with Botolo, Riccini, and 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 Rinaldi all on the left side for for Italy, because I th- I thought he really took strides last year, and this year has really not been good for him. He's he's really struggled, and like for me, it should be perfect for you to be able to start in front of Wantahena and provide that op like you know for him to provide you that support but maybe that's where there's that disconnect maybe that's what should be happening and he's just been not giving the chance and that's really affecting him i think it's just a a, a skill thing i think rinaldi is really good at serving and he's really good at attacking out of the back row but his reception is not good enough and his left side attacking is nowhere close to good enough i I just kind of think that's Mm. that's the player that he is i mean that's a little that is a little uh that's that's hard to beat when you're not when you're a left side attacker if you can't attack on the left side when you're a left side attacker yeah you probably need to you probably need to be able to attack on the left side if you are a left side attacker (laughs) um i i also wanted to talk about piacenza uh, laying an egg against chisterna out of nowhere and bleak classic pins of fashion i didn't watch any of this game but uh i Man, Chisarna gets credit. F.A. Byram with by far the best game I've seen him play in a while. 17 points on 13-23 with no errors is awesome. Um, Teo 4 was very good, but uh, I'm trying to scan through Piacenza's numbers and figure out, oh, of course, first place I look. Every, what's the first place you look when you see a Piacenza loss? What's the first place your eyes go in the stat sheet? Who who played right side, first and foremost? <laughs> Yuri Romanov. Who, who, and, who and, how, and, and how did he play? Oh, uh, five for twenty-six with two errors, and he got blocked three times. So zero percent terrible, <laughs> terrible zero percent efficiency on the week or on this one for Romano. Yeah, that's extremely bad. And, yeah, uh, if you're Piacenza, you just can't be doing this. You you are a Champions League quarterfinalist. You cannot lose to Chisterna. You just can't do it. No, I mean Telfor is he's a specimen. Oh, he's and really good. If, it's interesting because after last season, if you would have asked me which Frenchman was going to be tearing up the Italian league, I would have said Ibrahim Lawani, but he's been MIA uh, due, due to injuries. So Till Fall is the, the next guy. He's like, and, and Piacenza is just one of those teams that either they've got it or they don't. And they, like, they can have some lackadaisical guys, minus Simon. Like, Simon. I, I know I, I really want to get drunk with Ronnie because I'm sure Ronnie would tell us some <laughs> shit that Simone has tell as has has told him. So Ronnie, you better come to Ottawa. Um but like he I, he just looks like he's getting fr- he gets frustrated with that PHN's a team. Uh, yeah, sometimes. I would I mean I would too if I were him. Yeah, he's he and Lucarelli to me are the only guys who are really locked in on that team on a day to day, like point by point basis that are yeah. the most reliable. But um I mean, Romano was bad. We already said that. But the second outside hitter position was bad too. Rechine, Andringa, and Leal 
all three of them saw some time and none of them were good enough? No, I mean, I didn't think Ruchine was terrible offensively. He was five for 11. So it's it's not like, but if, if, if you aren't really having to get it on the offensive side, then your passing and defense would need to be there. And when Ruchine, like I, I, I give a lot of praise to Ruchina. He's looked fantastic this year, and, and yeah, you know, we gave a him year. we we gave him an award, but he was bad in this one, um, re- really bad in this one, um, uh, on on the defensive server side of things. And we're starting to see Leal come back a little bit um, into the mix, but he's still not a guy, especially at server receive. Speaking of teams that are bad and uh, played down to inferior competition, Lube Chivinanova lost the first set to Catania, twenty-five to thirteen. That was yeah. uh, that was one of the most jarring scorelines I've ever seen. They were able to rescue it in five, but uh, like that that never should have been happening. And Bartolome Chinineze was by far the best player on the court for either team. Nobody else was doing anything whatsoever except like kind of Alex Nikolov off the bench. Yeah, this one was was not one uh, that I watched uh, on on Wednesday, Rob. All these matches were happening at the same time, and uh, I didn't think it deserved my time, but I guess I was wrong, <laughs> um, especially with uh, Jacopo Masari dropping. Oh, wait, no. Paul Buchkeger, 26 for, for, for 54. They just shoveled with a million him. errors. Oh, that's, yeah, he, that's... He, he is a coal engine. They just fill him with coal and just just go with it, just, just ride on his back. But it's, it's a bit of a bumpy ride when you're on Buchkeger's back out there. Seven errors blocked six times. I mean, yeah, that's that's classic, like decent opposite on a bad team. Like that, that's what yeah. happens is you you put up a bunch of points on low efficiency and that just is what it is. But uh, I, I'm you, very, very low on Lube Chivinanova lately. And remember where they are in the Champions League as well, because they won their pool. It was the easiest pool probably ever in Champions League history. And they're going to get the winner of Zaxa and Hulkbank. Whoever, uh, look, looking forward a little bit, whoever wins that series will probably be favored against Lube the way they're playing right now. Hey, whoever wins that's that's going to be a spicy series. I'm looking forward to it. And actually, 100%. I think both of those I think both of those series are actually going to be streamed live on uh, on YouTube. I was looking through their uh, the CEV, and I think both of them are just going to be straight up on YouTube, which is awesome. Um, you what nice. you know what's so weird when you look at this match, Rob, is the fact that when you look at Lube's numbers, are not terrible. They had 17 blocks in this one. Anzani had seven. Don't know how do you get 17 blocks, and they didn't get a lot of aces in this one, but they kept the low er- errors low. Only nine serving errors across uh, five sets. Only wow. three aces. Only three aces. So they were serving some muffins out there, baking all day. Um, but <laughs> nine errors. So to to me, it just seemed like they were treating Wednesday like a Sunday. Usually Wednesday is probably just like a, a relaxed day sometimes. Um, actually, no, you play Champions League. So I have no excuses for them why they weren't up for this one. <laughs> but it just seemed like it was it was pedantic. Like they may not have Mizunos on. They may have had slippers. Love it. Uh, I agree. I, I can't find any excuses for Lube. I'm, th- their stock right now is is painfully low. And then uh, we've people have alluded to it already in the chat, but Monza against Verona. Monza was up 2-0 in, in a very good competitive match, up 2-0 to zero and on, in line to get a three-dong, and then Ron Takahashi got hurt. And so they lose 25-23, 25-22, 15-11, and get reverse swept. But like that's just kind of a tough break. And I and Lepke off the bench was not good at all, like you mentioned earlier. Yeah. But uh, this is just, like I can't fault Monza that much for losing this game. Just a, a difficult situation, and uh, I, I give Verona credit, is particularly Rock Mozic, who was unbelievable. Yeah, the Rock, like you can definitely sense a change in the game when um, Takahashi went down. And I mean, it's interesting though because I don't think Rand was playing exceptionally well, and especially if you go back into the Discord, you'll see that people he hasn't been executing fantastically recently. Right, but he does uh, solidify that serve receive really well. Like the serve receive with with him and even Gagini, who you know we all know how we feel about him. Gagini, real quick, he was really good, really good in the semifinals. Like fantastically good. Like give the bald man some credit. Um, but like even with him out there, when you have Mar, who's like solidly solid as a passer, and Takashi, who's really good, like it just puts them in such a good position. Um, and then Eric came in off the bench and I was excited because he has come in off the bench really well for this team, but that's mostly happened on the right side of the court where he's only had to swing. And 
it was ugly. It was ugly in service Eve. He was like rolling balls into the net. Like it was just a bad. It was like Eric Lepke against Italy back the 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 twenty world championship. That yeah, was bad. That the was last bad. world championships. Um, and I can talk about that easily now because he played fantastic this weekend. But I was hurting, <laughs> as I said, I was staying, I was steering clear from the Discord for a little bit uh, towards the end of this match. Yeah, all you need to know about. Marco Gagini, which by the way, Everett, it's Gagini. I, I need you to Gagini, I need you Gagini. I need you to fix that. Gagini. He he got served 49 times. The next closest on his team was 31. He got a six times. If you are leading your team in attempts by an order of magnitude as the starting libero, you've got a problem. Enough said. This is why, like, as as a coach, if I'm like if I'm coaching uh a team and i go to a tournament and i know nothing about the other team i go here's my order of business i'm serving the first five balls at the libero it's going to tell me two things first and foremost is that libero good enough to pass if the answer is no you don't need another game plan you just go after the shit you just go after the shitty libero but second number a second one is if they get have good situations they're just going to give that ball to the best player get him heated up boom you you show me your best player and then i'm going to set up the rest of my game plan after that so good sorry gagini no gagini 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 see you just say it with a with an accent yeah get get the hands out there that's a little bit easier for me gagini gagini the gagini okay there we go i'll just have to say it like i'm pretending i'm like i'm working at italy again and 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 we'll be fine <laughs> um uh but uh, but yeah, like Gagini when he when he's when he's bad, he's really bad. But he was pretty good this weekend. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, very bad uh, on Wednesday. Much better this weekend. Uh, I have yeah. nothing else to add about Italy because we don't need to talk about Trento or Perugia. Um, yeah. Would you like to move over to the women's side? Because I would like I would like to uh, move over to the women's side and because we I... were spot on about this, Everett. Spot on. Yeah. I only watched one of these matches, and it was Kerry. The only Ufara. one that you needed to watch because yeah, Scandici, and... yeah, Scandici beat Pinerolo three to one. This is the Coppa Italia quarterfinals on the women's side. Scandici won three to one. Corneliano three dong Firenze. Malonza straight up disrespected Roma. The, the second set was twenty five to five. <laughs> that was so disrespectful. Five. I loved it, I loved it. especially because Roma's like Roma's been a good team this year. It's not like Roma's are like you know they're in the Coppa Italia for yeah, a reason. Yeah. And, but yeah, they just Dude. say sometimes you don't get off the bus, even if it's in the middle of the set. Um, <laughs> but but uh, Kieri versus Novara was a banger, and it, we we hyped it up last week. We've been talking about Kieri. Uh, we talked about the matchup, saying that just because Novara has Vita Akimova doesn't mean that they're a shoe in to beat Kieri. And we were right. Kieri won yeah. three to one and looked really, really good doing so. Yeah. And I mean, I, I asked about it in the Discord, and I think it was Tommy who came up, but if it wasn't him, I I apologize to to who we've got too many Italians now. You guys are all too knowledgeable as well. Um, But but basically when I asked about this, this matchup beforehand and they said, you know, I think Kieri is a better team, but they don't have an athlete like Akamova. And we talked about it last week as as well. And that's exactly what like Kieri was firing on all cylinders uh, as a team. Avery Skinner was really good. She was 16 she was awesome. for 33. Kaya Gorbelna oh, was disgusting. Awesome. 21 for 46. And I really like her because she gets a lot of volume, but she's not your traditional looking opposite. Like she's not super physical. She doesn't, you know, she, she, she's she's pretty normal looking, but she's yeah, able just to, like pretty to tall and pretty skilled, but definitely not as explosive as most opposites in the in the top levels in the world especially in italy but yeah she was i mean 21 for 46 in a women's volleyball game is that is excellent that, that's very very good and skinner great too but the the area where i was surprised is in the middle because i thought that kind of the trio of sarah bonifacio anna Danesi, and christina kirikella like whichever two of the three and we kind of saw all three for novara i thought they would have a statistical advantage against kieri but our girl camila weitzel who we really like and uh katarina zakayu from cyprus of all yeah. places were both oh, she, excellent yeah i mean we've been high on weitzel for a while now like she was really starting to turn my head in vnl this summer and every time and like you can tell she's still young like once again I, I still think she has so much to grow she was really good eight for 11 uh Zak- 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 Chayu? 
Yeah, close enough. I, I'm honestly not sure how to pronounce that. I, I don't that, know. Is that Chow? Okay. Uh, like uh, once again, seven for eleven. Like they're like four they blocks. are sneak. Yeah, for four blocks. They are a sneaky good team. And Zach Chow, watching her, she reminds me a lot of Yuri Glider from the men's side. Like mm. really physical, really intense, somewhat unorthodox. Like I was watching her block the pipe, and she would like stand back. And then, like, really jump up to it. And I was just like, who is teaching her how to block this way? <laughs> but also, she I'm pretty sure she's in her 30s, so no one's changing it, right? Like, she's just a, a little unorthodox, but she just really dominates by her intensity and physicality. I, I like, I really like in, enjoying watching her play. And then yeah, the... I also think, real story, real quick, I'll let you talk in a second. Oh, please. But I thought Anna Gray has been fantastic uh, for them in the middle. She's a, she's another good at Italian middle. So between the three of them, Anna Gray, Zach Chayo, and Camila Weitzel, they might have one of the most underrated middle cores in Super Lego Volley Family. That, that is a nice little trio. I agree. And uh, so Zach Chayo, or however you say her name, she's only 26. Oh, she's, wow. She's, oh, my bad. I hope yeah, she she's a, this because I just only 30. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's a 98. But yeah, I, I actually like that Yuri Glotter comparison a lot. And I, I actually know exactly the play that you're talking about where she like basically took a step back and took a half approach, jump and block a bitch. It was very weird. I didn't know what I was looking at. But uh, cool play. And yeah, unorthodox player that has cool instincts and intensity and i like i liked watching her and i mean honestly love marie who's like their more physical outside hitter didn't even play that great i still won game three to one the the, the last two sets were really competitive like i just really really liked this match a lot it was just good ball between two teams that are pretty good but i mean the the thing for novara just nothing out of the outside hitter position nothing 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 they're really just really struggling they are it seems like they're a bit on a uh just a bit on an island over there. Yeah, 21 points total in four sets for the outside hitters is just not not going to do it. It's, uh, Think about that. It's five really points not. per set. Five points per set from your two outside hitters combined. Just not. It's just not enough. No, no, definitely, definitely not enough. You need you need a little little, little bit more production. And I mean, I, I think the same thing when you you just talked about Loveth Omarui. She is a player who, if she can really step up big time for for this team, like they, they really need her to be solid because of that that Italian foreigner or foreigner limit. Right. Like if, if they can step up and carry, if she can step up, then carry can start being. Really interesting, interesting here. But uh, to me, they're they're the fourth place team, but they are pretty far behind Scandici in third. I, I agree. I, I think this uh, this Coppa Italia semifinal. And it's a bummer. We have to wait like a month for this, well, almost a month, maybe three weeks. Uh, but Corneliano versus Chieri, like one versus four, and uh, Molonza versus Scandici, two versus three. Like that's exactly how I perceive the Lega Volley Femminile right now, and I'm excited about those games because I think like. Like Corneliano is basically just a better version of Kieri. Like they play similar ball, but they have better athletes, and Hawk is a better scorer than than Grabelna. But yeah. then Malonza and Scandici are actually kind of similar teams too, because they've got a ton of talent. They don't entirely know what to do with it. They, right they have sides. awesome. Yeah. They have awesome, awesome opposites, but um, everything else is a bit of a coin flip. So, like those two games when we get there are going to be awesome. I will have to say, real talk. Just about Kiri one second. I think we, we, I feel like I've talked about them a lot recently, but I've watched them a lot, a lot recently and they've been impressing me. I think Ophelia Malinov needs to be given her flowers on this one. 100%. Like she yeah, is out there her, having man. fun. She is running a good offense. She's manage, managing it well. And they're, they're rocking that all in. Rough couple years, a rough couple years to get where she's at, but it's good to see that she landed on her feet. Yeah. Uh, abs- absolutely. Um, do you want to talk about the Lega Volley Feminili? Um, I do. There's only one weekend. match I want to talk about. Yep, there's only one match from the weekend that I want to talk about, and then one match that I want to set the stage yep. for. And it's pretty typical for us that we like, we really like it when the best teams play each other. Corneliano beat Scandici in a donging, a good it was, old it was, fashioned donging. It was interesting for one set. The second set. Scandici, Scandici can look really good at times. They can look really good. They're up 11-6. They were up 11-6. And then, but when push comes to shove, push comes to shove, that team breaks down. Miscommunications, balls dropping that shouldn't be dropped. And then you can just see like, like one thing happens 
And you, if you could leave that door open just a crack for Centarelli and this Canigliano team, they are going to be going for gold. And it like just went for it. Like at that point, it was just like drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop. Then all of a sudden, Canigliano had all of the game over. And it was all over after that. Yep. That nobody smells blood in the water and capitalizes on that better than a Santorelli coach team. Like he's so good at identifying weaknesses, but especially mental weaknesses. And that was definitely a mental weakness for Scandici, leading by a ton in the second set and, and kind of getting blown out there late. I mean, there was it was I think it was twenty to twenty, and uh, Canigliano went on a five to one run. Like that's just not not acceptable if you're on the losing side of that. And uh, other than Ekaterina Antropova, who was pretty good, fourteen for twenty seven. Um, just nothing else. Just nothing else going on for Scandici. Zhu Ting seven was the second highest score. Just not good enough. And uh, Corneliano's serving ten aces, only eight errors in three sets. That's amazing. Yeah, they're they're they were deadly from the baseline, and they controlled the game, like especially in the, in the first and the third. They controlled the game from the baseline. Rob, I I have I have a bit of a theory here. Let's hear it. I I think that. Like I think of of all the teams, Scandici has like unity problems, like communication problems. Like they're not as close as a team as others. Now, and this is this is based off of uh, a fan of Zhu Ting's that we have in the Discord. You know, talk about how Zhu doesn't really speak Italian or or English even. So there's a huge communication barrier, I think, between her. And, and the rest of the team. Do you think that would affect like a team chemistry that we see them break down like this, that they just don't have that unity because like maybe they're, they're just not able to communicate as well between one another? Or am I, I, mean, am I just grasping at straws here? I I think that you are on the right track, but you're looking in the wrong place. I, I think that uh, mm. we need to start talking about Massimo Barbellini a little bit more. Ooh, and that okay. he, uh, over the last couple of years, the the locker room dysfunction of Scandici has not been specific to any particular player they've had on the team, but it's been consistent over the last few years with, uh, under Barbellini. And I think that um, that might actually be a bit of the problem. He's nowhere near the level of stooge of Mazzanti, for example. No, but uh, I, I don't think that he is the best manager of a locker room. Let's no, I mean, Hey, he, look what he did to Pietrini and Pietrini. A hey, is a great angel. example. Great angel, example, absolute angel. Um, but and it also has been. I was watching her highlights from Russia today. Like she has been killing it in Russia. Um, so yeah. Um, and uh, you can say one thing about Russia. You know they appreciate their athletes. That's why they give them all the free drugs to do. Um, <laughs> it's 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 bit it's bitter times right now in Canada. Just for a little context about that joke, wrote joke Rob St. Clair. So the IOC came out about how there was this Russian figure skater who was caught doping. Um, oh and wow! They, breaking they, news. a Russian breaking breaking doping. fucking no way! I can't it. believe it. No way! So they caught a Russian skater doping, and they took her out of the of of the like like the group thing. And they re-ranked the the scores, and basically the original thing was like Russia third, Canada fourth, and the IOC came out to announce that they've re-ranked everything because there was this banned skater who was competing, and they still ranked it Russia third and Canada fourth. So it's just like it's been an uproar, uproar this week, you know, Cold War two point oh, all because of <laughs> Sally and Peltier two point oh. My yes. my OG Canadian fans will 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 know that one back to two thousand two Salt Lake City. Oh, um, man, yeah, you you lost me. You're 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 getting too you're getting too winter sportsy up there in the Great Wire North. Yeah, come on, come on down, bud. We'll take you curling. Oh yeah, all right. Uh, let's. <laughs> I, I I love Canadian culture more than more than most non Canadians. But uh, if if you want to support Canada in some small way, you should hit up that volleyballstore dot com. Yes. I don't know where I got that segue from. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know how it supports Canada. Uh, in anyways, but yeah, head over to that volleyball that store. No, that volleyball store dot com. Still not used to that. Uh, use the code Spicy to get fifteen uh, percent off entire order. Um, someone actually made a big purchase uh, yesterday from California. So big shout out to our fans Love from to California. Hear it. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, one of my personal favorite thing. I mean, you can see Everett and I are rocking the nine by nine squared collection oh, yeah, right now. I, I, we are we are rocking both rocking it. I imagine it's beautiful. So get, pick up some of that. You should also pick up something from the Where's Daddy collection. 
because uh, no, if if you can't be Daddy Stankovic, which no, which none of us can, simply none yep. of us can look as good as this man. Uh, the next best thing you can do to try and look this good is to wear Daddy Stankovic on your person. So uh, definitely pick up something from there, and uh, you can also participate in the Where's Daddy game that we play every week on the show because Daddy Stankovic is hidden somewhere. And if you find him, then uh, you comment in the main YouTube comment section after the live stream is over. Comment the timestamp of where he is. And if you find him first, you get a shout out on the following week. So last week, we talked a lot about the Pro Volleyball Federation. And we're going to talk a lot more about the Pro Volleyball Federation in a little bit. Oh, yeah, we are. But as you can see, at the top of the screen there, uh, inside the Columbus Fury logo, is hidden Daddy Stankovic. So uh, Ozzy Tragic found him first. Micah Green was right behind him. Uh, good job to you two gentlemen for finding Daddy. Uh, maybe if uh, if Daddy had played for Columbus, they wouldn't have gotten three donged in their first match in the league the other day. Oh yeah, Ooh. that wasn't. Uh, at least it was away. At least they were they were you know at a at a bit of a win in away game. Um, oh, one here's here is like if if can we go back to the slide of the the uh, that volleyball store? This one, quick? yeah, yeah. So that Daddy shirt, there's like not an impossible chance that we end up getting sued one day because of it. Like if, <laughs> if, if, if Dragon Stankovic like sees it and he's like, what the like WTF is this mate? Um, and is, you know, mad about it. So that could be like something like, like part of a lawsuit, you know, it's like having flappy bird on an, on an old iPhone or something like that could be, be, that could be, you could have like banned contraband one day that is discontinued. And is part of the volleyball source nine by nine lore. Just saying, yeah. it's. I think that there's there's a lot of reasons to to pick up some of that, but uh, yeah, potentially being um, uh, contributing to a cease and desist from Daddy himself would just be awesome. So. Just think of the resale value. <laughs> right. Think about Hi, it. Peace, let's go. Think about it. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Champions League a little bit because it is uh, the start of Champions League playoffs this week. We had one match today on either yeah. side. Uh, Guaguas three-donged Prague on the men's side and Vakif Bank three-donged Zhezhov on the women's side. Um, the the men's match was a lot better than the women's. Uh, Nicolas yeah. Bruno was spectacular for Guaguas. Mm-hmm. 16 for 21 with no errors is insane. And uh, I think all these sets were real close, yeah? Yeah, look at that, 23, 23, 24. Good match. This this game was a three-dong in score only. It did not have the essence of a three-dong. It was a back-and-forth one. And, I mean, even when you look at differentials, like it was 21-14, and they only won 25-23. Casey Shouten went back and ripped three aces. And uh, that reminds me, actually, the first time I ever met Casey Shouten. Uh, it was at the Volleyball Canada National Championships. I was coaching a 17U team. We were playing for first in our pool against a team from Winnipeg. Winman, to be exact, we were leading 23-17 in the first. This redheaded big boy goes back to serve. We lose that set 25-23. And then he starts Whoa. the set. He starts the set on a 13-0 and run. So he went on a 19-serve serving run in May at nationals we were like ontario three that year we actually had a pretty damn good team and we were like we we were like on the road to beating them ended up losing uh later on that night drinking my sorrows away i was basically offered my first job at volleyball <laughs> canada so a little bit of uh, a little bit of everett lore right there that's the day, awesome that, the that's day, the day i met casey shouting and the day i i started my journey into uh into professional volleyball things that's an amazing story. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you shared that. Yeah, shout out Casey Shouten, shout out Finn McCarthy, and shout out Graham Vigrass. All three of them playing in this Champions League series. But yeah, Guaguas now with the big advantage. Obviously, this is the two match home and away Champions League playoff format where uh, next week all Guaguas has to do is win two sets. However, yeah. uh, if if Prague Prague it's in the Czech Republic next weekend. If Prague wins three uh, zero or three one, then we have golden set potential, and that's very possible. And I'm excited I, about that. I kind of think we have golden set potential. This was like like Prague is a is a pretty good team. Like like all 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 in all, and I mean I do think like the like Prague is like t- Prague's team is built for the Czech League. It's built for Champions League as well, but it's it's also built for the Czech League. Whereas Las Palmas Guaguas is just very much like. Let's just pick up a couple of random, uh, like Olympians, and see what we how how we can do. Let's just pick up Nicholas Bruno and and Graham Vigrass and and see where we go. Like it is very much like a hey, we're just this island team on the island. Let's it's all right, man. Figure it out. So <laughs> I could very much see 
I could very much see Prague back on three dong or three one, forcing that golden set. And then who knows what could happen? You could go out there and score a point for them and then win it. You know, it's fifth set. Sure could. And anything's possible. And then on the women's side, uh, Vakif Bank, three dong, Zhezhov. Uh, this was not close. This was by far the best Ali Franti has played all year. So that was nice for me and American fans to see 15 for 31 with one error. Like that's, that's spectacular. Ooh, so, yum. That was yeah, a good numbers. I like that. Led, led the, led the entire match. No, dang it. Uh, somebody on Zhezhov, Amanda Koneo, never heard of her. She put up 20. Mm. Wow. Cool. Uh, but uh, yeah, Franti, the best player on Vakif Bank. Good for her. Um, this is not surprising at all. And Vakif Bank should win this series. No problem. And this was in Poland. So next week in Istanbul, like, oh, good night. See ya. Yeah, good night. Uh, on, on to the next one. Um, rest of the week, let's see. On the men's side, both awesome games tomorrow. Berlin versus Tours is going to be super competitive. And Zaxa versus Hulk Bank is must, must, must watch. Mm, I can't wait. So I, good. I, I, I absolutely, is that when you're taking your lunch break tomorrow then, uh, uh, Sinclair? That is, yeah, 2.30 p.m. Eastern is Zaxa versus Hulk Bank. 1.30 my time. But yeah, I will, uh, I will do whatever it takes to be watching that game. Yeah, that 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 is going to be a good one. I can we we're we're at that point. Where we're going to talk about Plus League right now, right? Like that's what. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk about the two women's Champions League games just really yeah. quick. Promete versus Zaj Basha. That shouldn't be much of a game. That's no. uh, eleven a.m. Eastern, and then uh, the all German the German game. Derby. The German yeah. Derby. I'm I'm actually going to tune into that one. I think that's going to yeah. be a fun fun banger. You know, Potsdam like, versus Stuttgart. That 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 should be pretty fun, but. Uh, yeah, hey. uh, Promete versus Dodge Basha, don't bother. But the other three no. games, yeah, definitely worth watching. Yeah, t- tomorrow's going to be, what time is that one at? Uh, uh, Potsdam versus Stuttgart, it's at, at 1 p.m. So it's going to be a real crowded and uh, and, and busy time there. Um, but yeah, I, I want to talk about Zaxa. Sorry to, to, to cut off the Champions League women's talk. Nope. But Let's do they it. managed to pull off a bit of a comeback. And maybe, I don't know if it's dramatic, but maybe save their season uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, right? Like this, like if they had lost like this to Olshin. Who was good, firing, by the way. Who was, who was pretty good, but still like like they're fighting in that, that playoff race with, with, with them. If they had lost to Olshin, yeah, like Olshin's in 10th right now. So it's, and below, below Zaxa, but they're, they are, they are still pretty good. But if they were to lose like that after firing Samuel Vuo, it would have been like a very like Ooh, for the uh, pro Samuel Vuo crowd, which I'm not necessarily saying I'm in. I know people in the Discord seem to accuse me of this big Samuel Vuo lover. If he's not wearing the leaf on his chest, I don't care. Like, yeah, of course, I want to see him do good, but at the end of the day, like, he's not the guy. You know, he's you know, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever you put it. Uh, yeah, so this was on Thursday last week and was part of a really, really good day of Plus Liga games because we had this. I can't remember which one was first. Uh, there, this, one, this, this, match, this one was first, yeah. This, this, oh, yeah, this that's right. First, yeah. This one was first, followed by uh, Xavier Che versus Rusovia, which was also a good game. But yeah, uh, Zaxa versus Olsen was really, really fun. Uh, Wukash Kachmarek was outrageously good. 29 points, uh, 51% efficiency is ridiculous uh bednor is pretty good uh david smith 12 points on very high efficiency and then on the olsen side alan souza 29 moritz karlitzek 23 like this this was a heavyweight fight I, and uh i have the one play i wanted to talk about everett you you and i both lost our minds at this in the discord moritz karlitzek's windmill roll shot do you oh, remember that? Yeah, that was pretty filthy. Crazy. I've never seen a guy do the like you can do the windmill thing time if you are on the ball and it ends up being behind you. Like Ingapet does it a lot, DeFalco does it sometimes, but I've never seen a guy do that and then like, legitimately hit a nice soft touch off speed shot. It was insane. Yeah. That was really cool. I really like volleyball right now because you have all of these creative guys who are just kind of building off of each other. And they're just being like, oh, that's interesting. What did you do there? Well, I'm just going to try that and like do it myself. And I just realized how crazy my hair looks. So I apologize, everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this but, was a good game. And it may, I'm curious to see the implications for Zaxa as they go and play Champions League tomorrow. Can they, 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 can they, are, keep this going? they are starting to figure it out a little bit. And I think if you're Polish and you're in that league, you're scared. 
because you know like this is this is very reminiscent and like this is pretty much the team that made the run last year i think they're a little weaker down the middle um just in general so but like kashmar is really good in this one 26 for 43 with three blocks that's um, amazing yeah, the big, big, big numbers for him. So Alan Souza actually was was also um, pretty good, and I feel like he's been low key having a, a pretty good season in Ulston. Yeah, I, I like that fit for him. Uh, I do like Ulston. I just wish that they they have been the victims of a lot of five set losses. Ulston has lost a ton of five setters, especially recently. So hopefully they, they and Coach Javier Weber figure that out. But yeah, the, the the question for Zox is obviously can they tread water in their different competitions until Alexander Schliefen comes back? Yeah, and that's that's what I'm really curious to see is what what sort of fight can they put up tomorrow against Hawkbank without probably their most important player. Well, it's a bit of a, a bit of an important run too for Zaxa coming up. Like, don't they? Who do they have coming up? I know. Yeah, they have Rosovia on Sunday, so they have a they have a big matchup. They have Hulk Bank this week, and then Rosovia on on Sunday. So this is a huge week for Zaxa to really kind of test where they're at without Slivka, and like they have a they they still have to climb back into everything. Like. Uh, Champions League is Champions League, but they they still need to to be relevant. Like they're sitting right on the cuffs of eight, like on the cusp in eighth in the Plus Liga. Like I think they're I think they might even be ninth right now. Uh, but yeah, the 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 Hulk Bank series obviously is coming up. Then they have Rosovia this weekend. But then after that, they have Katowice, Radom, Barkum Lviv, Norvid, and Kuperum Lubin. Like those are five non-playoff wow. teams in a row so that if there's a time for them to make a run that's it but speaking of rosovia they had themselves quite the week. uh they had themselves yeah. quite and the week it did not go their way they lost to xavier three to one last thursday now i want to give them a pass on this because they were missing at least three arguably four starters four. yeah they were missing however uh, kuba you know, they're drizga um zatorski and who was the fourth that they were missing uh chable chable yeah but as as uh, I will always always say, uh, losing Fabian Gizga is a good thing. Yeah, that's a, that's that's definitely an, an upgrade. Um, and I mean, Rosovia came out flying like they like Lua T was banging balls from the baseline. Like Rosovia started this game like four like up four or five nothing. Boye was 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 pretty good as well. Um, but Zevierci on the other side is just they're a lot to handle. There, they are a lot to handle. That team's awesome, man. They're, uh, I mean, I feel validated from the Plus Liga preview <laughs> saying that that team is going to be really good. But another thing that I said about why they're going to be good is that they can be one of the best serving teams in all of volleyball. Like that, that serving rotation, those six guys. I mean, you have Miguel Tavares, who might be the best serving setter in the world, low key. Ooh, low key. You have Kvolek and Kleveno as the two outsides. Kvolek is a very good server, and Kleveno has some options. Butrin is a straight-up fireballer, and Biniak might be the best server on the planet. And then whoever their other middle is, like, whatever. But the, the service pressure that you have to endure from Xavier Che is, is ridiculous. And their home crowd is awesome, too. I really like that gym. I really like that fan base. Oh, their home crowd. Real talk, and I said this in the chat the other day, I kind of like their filming angle. In, in Zavierche for, for a few reasons, because it's literally like if you know their home gym, one side of it is a wall, right? Like it's like almost like a classic like uh, like university and gym where you've yeah. got the, the stands on one side, the other side is the wall because it's right beside it. And the camera is basically looking right down. You don't have that stupid volleyball angle where it's like far away and only like 20 percent of the screen is court. You get to see that depth of, of field from the court. And then also because of that angle, they're not trying to follow the ball. They're just going from one side to the other. It's actually a nice watching experience watching it from Zavirci. I know some people were complaining, but I really liked it. So that was a big segue. But that back wall of fans that they have there, the all uh, awesome. wearing the shirts, the fact that they all turn their back for TJ DeFalco, I meant to, oh, I actually downloaded somebody put it in the Discord and I meant I downloaded it, meant to send it to you, but we should use this in the show because so and someone asked about it in the Discord. Zavierce has this, the fans have this like award for the best player from the, the losing team when you come in. And the last time he was there, I don't know if it was the last time, but at one point he was there and he refused to accept the award because like they, they lost and he was bitter about it. So now they turn their back on him and they hate TJ DeFalco. 
So I love the Plus Liga. So I love the Plus Liga. That's awesome. I I, I love that so much. Like the active and base and being petty and hating opposing teams. Like that's good. That's what sports is all yeah. about. I love it. But but then I absolutely love the fact that the fans are gonna answer back to it. You know, and that yeah, that, that's great. Like that vision that that scene that they have of through the net across the court and. It's, TJ's getting ready to serve, and the entire crowd has his back face to him. is is rad. Is awesome. it's super awesome. It's super <laughs> awesome. So yeah, this is a really good match. Like right, at, it, like literally, it started like five minutes after Zox had beat Olsen in that five better. It was a very very fun day of Plus Liga learned, ball last Thursday. Also, I learned that the Plus Liga waits for the previous match to get done. So if there's a game going mm-hmm. on in Gdansk. The match in Vorsava that's after is waiting for that one to be done. So if the the one before it goes five, so if, and they they didn't really do three matches a day. So if you have three five setters, they can go super late, which is crazy. Like think about that in in North American sports. That would if, never if the, the late were waiting to tip off because the Celtics game was going into overtime. That would never happen. Never. never. But it's honestly kind of awesome. It, it's 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 the, it's the dead exact opposite of what happens in Italy. Where yeah. they just insist on putting all the games at the exact same time, and the, yeah. because the Plus Liga is so focused on putting all their games on TV, arguably to a fault, as yeah. some of their players would argue, um, it creates that experience where if, if you are a fan and you're just like watching all the games from afar, you're just sitting down and you're watching back to back to back games and not missing a single second of action. It's awesome. Uh, we definitely benefited from it on Friday, on Thursday. Sorry. Italy treats volleyball the way the Polish treat food, and Poland treats volleyball the way <laughs> Italy treats food. That's right? an awesome analogy. <laughs> Italy just throws it out, out there, like just all over the table. Here's all the pierogies, go at them. Or, and then, or sorry, that's Poland. But then in Italy, they go like course by course, like one by one. You eat like one, one thing at a time. There we go. Ooh, somebody in the in the YouTube live chat, Luke D said, "There's a cool fan channel that records all the Xavier Che games from sick angles." Uh, Uriska Armia. I need to check that out. I didn't know that that existed. That's a very cool hookup. Uh, put put a link to that either in here or in the Discord or in uh, like the comments after the video because uh, that that could be very cool. I would like to watch. Oh video. shit! My my chat was not refreshing and I just missed out. I've been. It's yeah. Cool. Thanks for thanks for letting me know. Uh, the other Rosovia match this week in the Plus Liga was a loss to JSW. I didn't watch any of this one, so I don't really know what happened. Uh, let, let me pull up the stats really quick. Do, I wonder if they still had like much less than much less than their full lineup. Uh, still no Jizgo. He came off the bench. Still no Zatorski. Still no Chabul, and still no Kokonovsky. So yeah, still kind of a skeleton squad. But Boye, uh, Boye twenty three, uh, much much lower efficiency this time. 14% and then, for boy efficiency. And Huber with 16. I mean, and seven blocks. I mean, we people people are on us, Everett, because we're not like on our knees worshiping Norbert Huber. He's really good, man. He's, Very good, yeah. He's probably a top five middle in the world at this point, And he has an MVP case in the Plus League. He's having a very, very good year. Is he the complete player that we like to say Simone Loster Smith are? No, it doesn't mean he's not still really, really good. And he puts up 16 points in a four cent match, like with seven blocks. Like, that's sick for a middle. That's really good. Is he the best I'm, middle in the world? No, but that's okay. Yeah, he's really good. But, that, but that's not even like the best numbers from a middle from the Plus Liga from this weekend. You want to know what the best numbers from the middle from a, from a middle from the Plus Liga is from this weekend, Rob St. Clair? Do you let's, know this let's yet? Hear it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to read, so. read you this out. Three aces. Oh, I, uh, three, three I, know, aces. I do. I do know. I do know. Three this. aces, know this. five blocks, eighteen for twenty-two. Eighteen for twenty-two in the middle. Eighteen for twenty-two in the middle. It was like, wow. Who? Who's? Who's this? That would obviously be Mateusz Biniak. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that stat line and twenty-six points for a middle blocker in four sets. Has probably never been done before in the history of volleyball. Like that we, is we, bonkers, absolute bonkers. Like just completely taking control of the game. It's crazy. Like, that that is nuts. Um, like the next highest ones was like like Cleveno had twenty three. Putrin on the right side had twenty two, and he he swung five percent efficiency because he was really bad in this because all the balls were going into the middle. Uh, unbelievable 18 for 22 five blocks three aces 
uh, that that has to be a plus league record for points for a middle blocker. It has yeah. to be. That, so that some was... somebody uh, if, if because Polish media is so good, I trust that they made an appropriately big deal about how huge of a game that was from Beniak. Yeah. If if anybody has any like fun superlative stats or anything about that performance, please drop it to us because. 26 points on 18 for 22 attack <laughs> for a middle. <laughs> like every time I say it, I, I I I freak out every time I read that stat line. Unbelievable. Yeah, that that is absolutely filthy. And I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a win against Katowice. So I mean, yeah, they're with, they're not very good, but that's okay. Take it with take it with a bit of a grain of salt. But I mean, hey, you, you, 26 points. I will say though, Rob, when you talk about that middle conversation about the top middles in the world. I do think that all three Polish middles are top 10. I agree with that. Yeah. Right? Like I think that like Kuba, Bieniek, Bieniek and uh, Huber are all in the top 10. To me, Huber just doesn't have that body of work that either of his two countrymen have. Right. Right? Yeah, he's, e- either of his two countrymen have. Doesn't have the resume yet. He's a very, very good player. Doesn't have the yeah. resume yet. Like, does does Huber have all the tools to be quote unquote the best middle in the world? Yes. Right? Like maybe like, when Robert Lanny Simone retires. When when when, when Robert Lanny Simone retires, that'll that'll be a big question. Because and I think and like and Robert Lanny Simone's gonna retire probably around the same time as David Smith. And then Lozair will be that next guy. And I don't think Lo Lozair is is a dominant guy. Like he's not physically dominant, so he's always gonna stay on top of that list. But the the middle landscape in the world is going to change significantly in a few years when some legends retire like Lushniak, right. Raskinin, Simon, David Daddy. Smith, Daddy, Graham Vigras. Going to be a yeah rough couple of years for fans of great middle blockers like me. I love all those guys. Uh, thank you, Peter, in the chat saying, yeah. uh, yes, in fact, it was a record for points for a middle blocker in the Plus Liga. Previous record was Lisa Knott's 25, but that was a five-setter. <laughs> and Beniak did this in four. <laughs> it's crazy. 18 for 22 is seven percent efficiency six and a half points per set for a middle oh, this is spectacular uh incredible yeah. all right let's uh let's move on that's because honestly, like, that's that's high school volleyball like that is high school volleyball when your setter and middle play on the same club team like that's 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 what that is pretty much all right let's uh let's turn our attention to north america because there's a lot to talk about about this We're going to spend some time talking about the Pro Volleyball Federation because they kicked off in a big way last Wednesday night. And in their first three matches in league history, they put 24,713 butts in seats, many of which were uh, 11,000 of which were at the very first game last Wednesday night in Omaha when the Atlanta Vibe beat the Omaha Supernovas uh, 3-2, to which was an awesome game. I, I I want to hear all your thoughts, Everett, about just the about the level of volleyball and the the quality of the product and overall. But uh, even with all of my like mixed thoughts and associations in American professional volleyball, like, this is a spectacular accomplishment and is fantastically good for the game. First and foremost, like game one, you've got like eleven thousand people in the stands in Omaha. Like that is those are those are big numbers for volleyball. Huge. Any- those those are still at, like that's bigger than most super league stadiums that bigger than the majority of plus league stadiums like that is massive for volleyball professional volleyball doesn't get those kind of numbers like no, it World doesn't league nations league doesn't get that kind of number so that's absolutely massive and i hope i hope they continue it um i'm gonna say rob the overall product is one of the most is one of the more enjoy and enjoyable watching experiences uh, I've have I've had watching volleyball, um, just in the sense like it, it, it was, it it felt very comfortable. It it felt very uh, at home. I thought the level of ball was actually pretty good. You can definitely tell that it's like it, it's it's not the Superliga and it's not Turkey. A, it's it's not top level of like that. And you can kind of tell it's a very defensive league, and the numbers are real low. Like offensive oh. numbers. <laughs> Offensive numbers are real low. You can 100% tell that it is everyone else from the NCAA, right? Where that all of the big name hitters are going to overseas after after they finish or to love BV, BB, but we'll talk about that later. Like we won't talk about the fact that all the national team players are going to, 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 the, to the other league. And this is kind of everyone else. We won't, won't touch on that for a little bit, but you can definitely tell that like it, they're they're missing that 
those those star offensive players. And I think that's going to come. But the brand of volleyball is, is entertaining. It's good, solid. It's good, solid volleyball. Good, solid rallies. Um, the broadcast for me and Rob, you and I were going back and forth about it a, a little bit, especially on, on that first night. It did leave to me. It was it was solid. Like you had two commentators on one person who knew volleyball generally and another person who is generally a man who didn't. Um, I don't know where that happened. Obviously, we're going to be pretty critical of it because like we know some pretty good volleyball commentators are sitting right here with us. Um, and we'd like to be a, a, around that. And like the overall production value was no better than like a regular season game of your local college. Right, like right. Like, uh, so they 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 couldn't f- quite figure. It seemed like they had some last second issue with where they were going to broadcast it because they have they have this sort of weird mixed deal with some Valley Sports Live app C- and something called CBS Watch and Valley Sports Live and CBS and Sports Stadium app. So, yeah, but then it just ended up that the first couple matches were on YouTube, which is I mean is great for the viewer, but like it was just it seemed like there were some some issues with uh, their broadcast rights holders, whatever. Can't broadcast volleyball at 720p. No, it is. Can't do it. But like, would you say you can't do it? But we literally watch Super Lega on the best. Yeah, so this like, is this is so, the so this United is States because, we're talking about. This so is this is, this is, but, is this, but this is at least 60p. We're gonna we're gonna give it to them. So like, me a second. Yeah, th- this is but this is this is American professional sports. This isn't this isn't volleyball world. And their horrible platform. This isn't Euro Volley TV and that horrible platform. This this isn't Boomers and trench coats. This is a brand new entity in American sports who I do not give a pass for broadcasting in 720p. That's not acceptable. The commentary was not good enough by my standards. Uh, the camera angles and and all just the it wasn't a very innovative broadcast. So that there, there were a lot of chances to do some things that were cool. It was pretty limited in this, in the storytelling other than the obvious that it's the first match in league history. But again, this is fantastically good for the game. I have a buddy from Purdue who lives in Omaha and is like a ancillary volleyball fan. And he, and he bought season tickets to these Omaha supernovas games and him and his fiance were there. And he said that it was fantastic. He said the vibe in the, in the arena was outstanding. And then he's excited to go back to more games like that. That that sort of thing is is what is most promising to me is that they can put out a compelling in arena product to keep putting butts in seats because that's how the league is actually going to sustain itself financially. And there are a lot of those things about the broadcast that I think are pretty easily fixable. Absolutely. Start, and I mean, like we're we're nitpicking this. Better commentators. Yeah. Like this. Is, yeah. And I mean, the fact that you guys go to a, a break or a timeout, but it's literally just the real sports logo or, or pre. Yeah, there's you got to do a lot more with that. Get B roll, get interviews, get uh, like it's have commentators. Like, even just stand in there and, and talk about the game a course, little bit. Of course. Like, that's once again where you need commentators who, and like once again, it's, it's generally been a play by play person who doesn't know volleyball and a very good person, like a person who knows about volleyball and they're, you know. They're, they're doing the color but overall i mean if, if we want to talk about some of the games i mean the first one was a banger i mean atlanta comes away week one they're two and oh baby two both and on oh, the road both on the road two five setters um you absolutely love that where are the results yeah, I've, got, I've got the stats up so it, uh, on night one it, the atlanta vibe went up 2-0 in omaha and then uh fell asleep in, a bit in sets three and four i think omaha gets a lot of credit then uh, it was a it was just a miracle run, a miraculous miraculous run on the serve of Tori Dilfer. That they were down thirteen to ten in the fifth and went on a five to nothing run, like a side out, and then a four to nothing service run to end up winning the match fifteen thirteen. So uh, other than the painfully no, low offensive numbers, I mean, you said it that they were that they're very low. I'll go as far as to say that they were painfully low. The inability of some of these players to score points. Yeah. Very defensive minded. Definitely had an NCAA feel to the the, the mm-hmm. level and the style of the game. But I mean, five sets and um, a late like miracle comeback to win the first match in league history. Like the the whoever is up high at the PVF like couldn't have scripted that any better. No, I mean Leah Edmund, Edmund coming in twenty seven for seventy, right? And that just speaks to how long some of the rallies so far in the PVF have been. Like they go on for a while. Sixteen so percent efficiency for Atlanta, twenty two for Omaha. Um, 
a lot more errors on the Atlanta side of the things. 17 in total, seven for Edmund uh, uh, on her alone. Grace Cleveland, who actually impressed me pretty quite a bit. She was Purdue a new girl. A, Purdue girl, yeah. 11 for 43, six errors as well. So, you know, you, it's interesting because like Bethany De La Cruz, who now comes off the bench for the Dominican Republic, is still out there and 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 scoring points for for them. So it's 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 going to take some time to figure it out, but it's it, it's it's still pretty entertaining. Like it, it's a yeah. fun watch. Like I I absolutely enjoy watching it. And um, actually, like we can talk about the game on Thursday night. Uh, Let's do it uh, a, a little bit uh, between Grand Rapids and Columbus. And I, I had a I had a I guess it was on Friday night, but it doesn't really matter. This this one was good too. Grand Rapids winning um their first game at home which was which was really nice for them uh this one was was a donging it was indeed and a big shout out to claire chasse who i've always really liked since she was in the final four at louisville and this is like a 5 11 six foot like outside hitter type player who's not dominatingly physical but is super duper skilled crazy fast i mean she passed her passing numbers were unbelievable 44 percent perfect 75 percent positive and yeah. a 21 for 50 at 32 percent efficiency like for and 23 points in three sets like that's insane and for this league uh th- that is uh, going to be an offensive performance that holds up for a little while especially for an outside and big shout out to ashley evans as well who's starting at setter on that team another purdue girl um who's been like kind of on the fringes of the national team for a bit but like one thing that I'm wondering about about the the PVF in general is will the will the offenses like will the teams actually develop offensively as they figure themselves out or will this is or is this just like kind of the league's identity because there is not a single like there, especially at the opposite position I don't see a single player in this league who can actually score any points like the way that we're used to seeing it over in Europe. No. One thing to note about, about the Columbus Fury, just to touch on this game ago, they are missing, like, first pick of the draft overall, Asia O'Neill. She was out in this one. Former national team player, Megan Courtney Lush, she was also out for this one, and as well as their setter, Jenna Rose- Rosenthal. So right. they're, they, they're, they're missing some bodies over there in Columbus. So uh, that result, we're having only one player in, in double digits is, is uh, not uh, understanding. And you know what, Rob? I think it's going to be, I think it's going to take a little bit of time for some, for some athletes to kind of get into it. I think why Leah Edmond was so good in, in that first one is that she's been playing in AU pro sports for the past number of seasons. So she's been used to a, she's been living a pretty cushy, cushy life playing AU pro sports. Like, like it's a lot of, of training. You get paid pretty well for, you know, like not much of a grueling compared to, to an actual league. But she's been used to like playing a real style of volleyball, uh, if you will, where you're not getting subbed out. So, yeah, I think it's going to take a little bit of time. But I, I, I mean, I think you would know the landscape better than I. Like, I, I really only know two athletes like intimately in this entire league, and it's going to take me some, uh, I, uh, a little bit of time to, to to figure it out. But, um, but well, yeah, uh, I mean, kind of like kind of like we said, this is basically just a continuation of the NCAA it's all it's the NCAA players who weren't quite good enough to go play at the, at, at the big time levels in Europe or crack like the big time levels with the national team because like you said those players are uh, otherwise spoken for but uh that and it is exactly the, the the style that we see in the NCAA you don't have point scoring opposites in the NCAA like that's no. not how it works there and that, that's weird because because it's because of the substitution thing and like if if bf is going to play international style substitutions only six with the one in one out rule that's going to be the biggest adjustment for these players is because they're so used to being able to ds one of their outsides and they pull their opposite out in the back row and ds for her they have a libero who can serve for one of the middles they like there there's so much more specialization and not nearly as many six rotation volleyball players that come out of the ncaa now so that's good that's going to be something that the first team to get one or two players in the PVF that figures that out is going to dominate for a little while, because if you can have pin to pin scoring in every rotation, then you're going to be better than everyone else. Cause right now, nobody has that. Nobody has sideline to sideline scoring ability in every rotation in the PVF yet. So that's the evolution in the offenses that I'm looking to see. Like how much, how much are they actually able to spend time in the gym? Because their their travel schedule is a little bit weird and doesn't seem like there's a lot of, system yeah. to it it's they're like, it's, they're it's definitely got a like, scattered they, way 
they're playing like like there was three games this this week and Atlanta's already played two and other teams haven't played any and there's two games this week but both of them are in San Diego so San Diego's going to play two so we're still figuring it out I do think though Rob that this is right now this is the MLS but way further than when the MLS first started right this is the MLS maybe not quite now because I think the MLS is starting to get a, a lot better but it is not the leftovers because the leftovers are are still pretty good. They're not like they're not like leftovers from like a couple of nights ago. They're they're from lunch, right? So you're just having like a little bit of like they're still pretty good and and like they're still within the the day, but they're just like they're not the first pickings. You know, it's not the first chicken breast that you're going to pick off, off the plate. Uh but maybe it's the second. Um but then you all, you're getting all of these like somewhat studs from the USA who are young and figuring it out, and then these old like wily vets like Bethany de la Cruz, and then Grand Rats has a uh, uh, Amelia Dimitrova who's the Bulgarian right. like, like like legendary opposite uh, who 14 points in this one. So I think it's gonna it's gonna be interesting to see. I'm interested to see how it's going to develop. I've heard that they're gonna be doing a weekly sh- like kind of like show talk show uh going on with this too but i haven't seen anything about that as well uh it's been interesting to see because of before this match pvs had like had like a thousand subscribers on youtube and now they're sitting at uh 14.3 and the games have gotten like all right numbers like 100 and 109,000 for the first one 64,000 for the uh, uh second and 55 for the third yeah, decent. I mean, if, if they had known further in advance that those are going to be on YouTube and could have promoted their channel more, I think it would have been a, been a bit of a different story. So but before I have, I have a couple more takes about the league yes. overall. Another road win for Atlanta. Uh, they beat the Orlando Valkyries, another three to two. Fun game, uh, two overtimes and sets two and three. Um, Adora Anai, who I didn't know anything about, led Orlando in scoring with 21. Uh, Atlanta similarly balanced. Uh, Leah Edmond, I think, got got banged up a little bit late and ended up having a really quite bad statistical game. But you saw Yosiana Presley off the bench, who I remember loving when she was at Baylor. So that was cool to see. It's like it's kind of some like blast from the past sort of names that like, oh yeah, I remember you being a superstar in college five years ago. I wonder what you've been up to. Like that that that's kind of what. Yeah, and I mean, like, so, like, on, on Orlando, you got Canadian uh, international Shana Ryan Joseph, Joseph. Who's on the right side, who you know, like, made a run to the final fourth with Florida for a few years ago, and everyone was up in arms because Karch was like, you know, gabbing about her on on the broadcast, and I mean, like, Shana's a homie, like, we go back, and I know that for her was just a bit of a, like a, yo, let's go, uh, type of moment when you have <laughs> a Karch like, you know, gushing gushing over you and pretty much saying everything, but like, I wish you were American to come play for me just because of her her attitude. Um, I mean, though, although she didn't have a great game, she was six or 34 zero, zero percent efficiency. efficiency, so not too great. Uh, from my girl, but you know, talking about Leah Edmond, like, sure, she didn't swing on a lot, or she swung on a lot of balls. And I'm not like, this is this is like this. Look at these stats, really scare me. Um, it's bad, it dude, rough because like she was having a bad game, minus six efficiency, 10 for 51, and you just kept on giving her the ball, like something else needs to happen there and the fact that you guys still won that that's that's a lot um <laughs> but she passed a boatload of balls she she was targeted 52 times out of 91 in surf receive there for atlanta dude i'm, I'm telling you i i want to see over the next couple of weeks i'm gonna give this league a long leash but the the on-court product as far as offense i really think leaves a lot to be desired right now um but- a, Again, there's but a, there's also a... we know that because we watch international volleyball. How much of this fan base is going to be watching? Like, how many people in Omaha are watching Super League? Probably very few. But I, I if those people get used to ten percent efficiency as a team for your offense for a game, that I don't think is the best thing for the sustainability of the product. The product is better when points are actually being scored. And obviously, one one reason why people love women's volleyball is that the, the rallies are longer, which is great. But there, there is a there's critical mass for that. There needs to be termination. There needs to be point scoring and physicality at, at, at some point, yeah. somewhere. And right now, the league doesn't have that. So I'm going to give them uh, I'm gonna give them several weeks to, for the teams to figure it out and, and just you know it's- figure out how to watch film pick on advantages and develop chemistry and just figure out how to score points but that part of it is not there yet and i that part of it i didn't like 
early. It's a, it's matches like this, Rob, where I really think that there's too much volleyball in volleyball, right? And there's too much of it to, to consume over, over one match. Like, the first, this first match was two hours and 55 minutes. The second match was three hours and, and two minutes. And, like, that's with very, like, they don't do, like, a big pregame show. Like, they don't have a big, big pregame run-up. They don't do a big postgame show. Like, that's pretty much the, the game time, which, which is yeah. nuts, nuts to think about. Like, those are long rallies to watch. Three when hours think, is too long for volleyball. When, when you think about, like, when you compare it to the NFL, the NFL runtime is three hours, but the majority of that is filler. Like, I've never been to an NFL game. I've been to CFL games. And, like, there's the majority of the time you're sitting around waiting for the play, for the play to happen, right? I've talked about this before. You know what I'd love to see? Best of the seven games to 15. You have to you have, you need you need less points to win a game, so it's not going to create as long of games, but it creates way more tension, more back and forth. I don't hate that. Um, the la- last couple of things I wanted to bring up: one, that they have volley station stats in the pre- in the PVF, fantastic. They have bolt six instant replays and challenges, fantastic. Love Ex- excellent choices there. So they, they they're making great choices with their tech and their like volleyball specific stuff to to implement in the game that is you know just the the global standard now so that's great the the i was i was going to bring up the the match times it's too long three hours is too long of a match the the breaks between sets are far too long i hate the ncaa thing where they take like a 15 minute break after set number two i hate that and they're they're doing something like that in the pvf it's more like a seven or eight minute break too long there's no halftime in volleyball don't, I don't lose. I don't mind it. I don't no, mind I, it. I, I, I hate I don't, that. I don't mind it. I, 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 just, I don't mind it for for a few reasons. A, like, for the, the 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 fans in the crowd, get up, go to the bathroom, go get a drink, go go get a piece of pizza, popcorn, whatever you want. You know, every other sport, hockey has periods. You get the two. You get the two intermissions. There's half times in in basketball and in football. Every other. Uh, North or uh, North American sport has it in that baseball's boring as shit. No one cares to miss anything, anyways, <laughs> right? Like unless you're True. watching the Dodgers, no one's gonna care right now. Um, okay, well if if you're gonna keep the if you're gonna keep the, the all the breaks, like you said earlier, that has to be filled with something on the broadcast. It has that's, to be filled with something on the broadcast. There's absolutely. so much more that could be done with that dead time, especially just educating relatively new fans about volleyball. You need more content, off-court content. And mm-hmm. both, that's both during matches and outside of matches, which is something I'm really curious about. You said like they have a plan for some sort of talk show or like YouTube live show or whatever it's going to be. I want to see that, and I want, I want that. I want that to be expanded as much as possible because the storytelling – in between matches and day to day like people that that's what gets people to really follow and care and understand the personalities understand like all that stuff about north american sports that makes that's what's why we do sports better than anyone else in the world that that sort of thing is necessary for for any young league in any sport so it do they have to focus much more on media outside of match time yeah absolutely and i mean let's let's be honest this is the first big shot in the north american volleyball wars like this is the first real shot sent off in the north american volleyball wars um au pro volleyball like no like that that was just nope. kids playing in sand buckets like i i love the fact that there's like kind of some sign of link between au and pvf and so like that's why you're seeing au players playing the pvf with which which i think is, is super cool um but the next 10 years are going to be really interesting here as we start to figure out this landscape that is uh, North American professional volleyball. And you're 100% right, Rob. Like, we need to move on. And it, it's a really topical conversation right now in Canada with the PWHL starting. And it was, it was really interesting on Friday night. You know, I had a buddy came over and he knew nothing about volleyball, but he was jazzed up and he was asking all the questions and he was acting like a four year old dad, like, oh, whoa, 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 what did they just do there? That was crazy. That was nuts. Like, what just happened? And I'm trying to explain to him, but like, I can't, I can't explain it on a level that he's going to understand. So it just, it just us talking in circles. Um, but, you know, we go to put it on and on my YouTube, it's PWHL and the Pro Volleyball Federation. So it's cool that women's sports are taking over. But the conversation we're having about the PWHL is moving on from that celebration of firsts. 
And I think this is this is something that women's sports get into a hundred percent because it's all the about the let's let's do for the next generation. Let's give them hope and let which is absolutely great. I'm a hundred percent for that, but fuck it. Let's care about these girls now. Yep. Let, let, let's let's care about the the wins and the losses and the pluses and the minuses and the scoring and the not scoring. Let's let, let's put a billion into now. And that's exactly why like, like Rob, I was messaging you and I was like, we really need to go hard on the PVF. Like we need to put like treat it like it is the super log of like a feminine or any of the top European leagues, like the champions league, because it, like it needs that kind of momentum and to talk about it past being that it's a great thing that the women get to play pro volleyball. Thank you. I, I couldn't have said that better. It's it, we are, and we are going to continue to cover the PVF and we're going to be intentional about the tone with which we cover it because we're going to talk about these games like their games in a major sports league that is gender agnostic we're going to talk about good individual and good team performances we're going to talk about bad individual and bad team performances that that women's sports needs more of that it's not just a it will of course there are celebratory aspects to the opportunities that we're giving top level female athletes yeah. now but this is sports Sports are sports. There are winners and losers. There are people that don't like each other. There are there are there is drama because there's win and losing. There's heartbreak. There is joy from on court performances. It's not just like kumbaya, all like give each other hugs after the game, even though you get three donged. I mm -hmm. want I, I want this league to develop in such a way that you hate teams, develop yep. rivalries that have legitimate fire, hate it's losing it's fights in the stands, hundred <laughs> percent. Like it's 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 why I watch two Thailand women's volleyball teams so much sometimes is because they don't hate losing. They're okay with it. It, it it bothers me when teams don't hate to lose, and that 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 we're, that's how we're going to talk about the pro volleyball federation. That it, this is a real sports product with real athletes who are competing at a very high level, who care about their on court product and who care about the results. This isn't just about building a league for mm -hmm. for top level female athletes. This is about winning matches and winning championships, and that's yeah. how it should be talked about across the board. And that's how we're going to do it on the show. If if we have to, if if the conversation around this league is only about it's amazing that we're that we're giving them the, the women these opportunities, then this league is already a failure. Doomed. Right? Doomed. Doomed. Like that that cannot be the conversation around it by the end of the league. Much in the same way that AU Pro was at, at the end of that first year. AU and Pro I, Volleyball, the entire every second that that league spent in existence was just celebrating. But still, it's it. still, still going. It's still is, happening. Is it? They, they, but like, not, not on the same level. I mean, I think it's also important to understand that, like, AU is is bigger than and like they do softball and they do lacrosse and I think they do basketball. I know. Like they, they it's like and yeah, yeah. So it's 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 much bigger than it's 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 much bigger than that. But yeah, because but it's like, not a good sports product. It's not no. a good long term sustainable sports product. It's just not because because the whole point of it isn't about creating a league it's about celebrating women in sport right which i think if if you want to celebrate women's sport we absolutely have to and that's absolutely important creating a league based off it is not the is not the point of it and it's not going to serve anyone anyone right it's like that there's like a soccer tournament that's called like the she believes cup like that's the stupidest thing ever like i know i know that's going to strike a chord with with some people but like no like let's let's it's let's disrespectful to female athletes to treat I, them I, just like they're just yeah. like they're out there celebrating it's disrespectful to the levels of competitor that they are to to not talk about their sports and their their on court performances the same way that we talk about every other sport in every other place in the world it's not good for the game to talk about it like that and that's not how we're going to do it on the show we're going to we're going to analyze the matches just like we do for the Champions League final yeah absolutely and i mean like that's that's one of the one of the things that like, we don't talk about that gender equity within sport a lot on this show and I've had friends of mine who I respect deeply who have been like, when are we doing a podcast? I want to talk, I talk about like the women's like, like role in sport and all of this stuff. And I'm like, that, that's like, that's fantastic. But like, that's not the platform for this show. There's so many other platforms that do stuff. Like if you want that, like go to the gist, like go to like women's sports. Like there's so many other like fantastic, like sport, like female outlet, like female outlet, like female driven sports outlets sorry for you to go to where they're going to talk about those things that are important conversations but 
we talk about X's and O's, baby. We talk about yes, wins we and do. losses. We, and, then, and that's out. So this is and if, this is going to be if, the only conversation we have about this regarding right. the, the PVF and even um, one league volleyball when they start start up in the fall. Um, like this, this, this is all we're talking about it because from yeah. now, what matters is performance, baby. Let's go. And on that note, shine up, girl. You know, you know, you do play better. Nice. Yep, play better. Then the last thing I'll say on 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 this topic is that if you want to talk about gender equity in sports, I'm you look at look at men's volleyball in the United States. If let me tell you right now, if the genders were swapped and the numbers were the way they are, there would be riots in the streets. Oh, I, I, absolutely. Like, if, if you had the number of, like, male athletes who, are, who play the sport as, as, as like, fem, female athletes, um, if you had the success uh, that they've had at, at the international level, if you had the success that they've had that you've seen at the NCAA level, where I think after this season you could 100% say that, like, NCAA women's volleyball is the third biggest sport in the NCAA. It Football, is. basketball, women's volleyball. Like, like th- that's what it is. Like, like, but like, think, imagine if that, like, you know, there are hundreds of NCAA women's teams. There's a 64 team tournament. Imagine if there were that many men's teams, and, and no only, league. And, and no, and no, and so few women's teams. Like, if yeah. if the if the gender disparity in the United States for volleyball were switched. There would be riots in the streets. Well, I mean, it's football. No, if oh, the yeah. gender disparity were switched, if there were way more opportunities for men to play volleyball than for women to play volleyball in America, there would yeah. be riots in the streets. Instead, yeah. because the men are so 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 disserviced by the lack of opportunities to play volleyball in the United States, nobody cares. Except me, I care, and that's why I'm going to continue to talk about the volleyball okay. league of America. Let's not let's even... not let's not end. Well, let's not end our, our our conversation about women's volleyball starting up with you being like men are disserviced. So, <laughs> I, I I wanted to keep that in perspective because we're going to talk about women's volleyball the way that it deserves to be talked about. But you, I care about men's volleyball. That that that's that's what I love. And that's what I fight for because it is incredibly inequitable, the situation in my country for. That's a fact. So I'm going to talk about the Volleyball League of America, even though nobody cares and nobody thinks it's legitimate. Nobody watches the games. Nobody cares the storylines, but I do. And I'm going to keep talking about it because there's more, just as much work being done going the game, especially on the men's side, as there is the women's. We just don't have a, a, even a fraction of the resources. So I'm going to talk about the VLA as if it matters because it does to me. Okay, okay. I was never like debating that. I was just saying that like we didn't need that. We didn't need to sewer sur- the, the women's game like that. But this weekend, you guys have v- Central Division d- event number one. I mean, you called it. Iceman crushed it. I tuned in yep. at one point and just saw Team Pineapple getting slaughtered, and I was I, I was feeling bad a <laughs> bad a little bit about that one. But uh, how how did weekend number two of uh, the 2004 VLA season go? Just about how I expected it to go in the Central Division. It's a uh, obviously it's my home division. There's two teams in Chicago. I live in Chicago. I know I know the scene intimately, and I was absolutely right in my prediction that the Icemen were going to dominate. That team is very good. Andre Brown was a massive difference maker, Everett. I'm sure you'd be happy to hear that. Big Canadian boy. I called happy, it. Not, he, surprised. Yeah, not surprised at all. He was brilliant. He is so physical. His service game was insane. And uh, we had a like, so ve- the very, very last set of the weekend was a pretty gnarly overtime. It went 36 34, which I think is the second deepest in league history. I think we had a we had a 38-36 a couple of years ago in the in the championship in 2022 but uh 36-34 was sick it was really exciting and Andre Brown stuff blocked the ball to win the match so uh that was very fun uh, I thought the Chicago Swede looked pretty good and I thought team pineapple for like being really young and having new dudes and not playing together that much was actually better than I thought they were going to be so uh Okay. Not 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 terrible on their part. The, the problem is though for the Iceman, uh, my boy, one of my favorite players, Dave Hancock, my former teammate, got hurt. I heard oh. his he hurt, he hurt his knee in the very first match, and uh, it is going to be a pretty serious knee injury, and he'll be out for a good long while. And 
they need outside hitter depth badly. So, um, so they managed to still go four and zero, even though they lost one of their best outside hitters. Correct, they did. Damn. Okay, and so yeah, they're 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 the Icemen are thin at outside hitter, but they'll uh, they're they're so good everywhere else that. Uh, they're still going to be a title contender for sure. So no VLA this weekend, but then the weekend after that, like the weekend of the 10th, um, the central division is back in action and the East division kicks off the same weekend. So we'll be like doubling up on ball that weekend, which will be very fun, including like a Friday night primetime game on the East coast, which is going to be sweet. All right. Sick. So, so just, is it like a central division tier one event or is the central division open event or it's the, it's, it's just another tier one regular season event. Exactly. Like okay. the one that's on screen. And then the same thing in the East uh, team LVC, the Boston bounce, the Northeast force, like three team double round Robin. All right. Gotta love it. Um, have you ever guys, I know we, this is, have you guys ever talked about just like screwing tier one, tier two, starting at the bottom and letting everyone just like race to the top. There's too many teams. There's no, there was no way we could be able to do that. We have to like, we have to give a, a, a. There has to be a standard on who competes where, when, and how. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it would be too much of a disorganized free for all, and it would be like too much of an advantage to the teams that can that have the means to play the most. Just, I was just thinking, in like in the context of like, if you think about esports, um, every season of like an sports league, they'll always be like a re-ranking period, and you can kind of like place a ranking match, like someone based off of where you were, and then they're, they're going to like 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 kind of rank you for that that, that new league i'm just i'm just it's, it's, it's cool idea idea. We, yeah we actually have thought about that like sort of a challenging system where you can play a team ranked above you and take something from them we've we've talked about it but like what Ooh. the vla the best two things it has going for it are the model of of how many teams it's able to include and the, and the systems by which teams are in points and get promoted and all the levels that there are and the inclusivity the league is up to 61 teams 61 that's unbelievable like that what what we are doing with literally no budget at all creating a place for 61 volleyball teams in the united states to play should not be being overlooked the way that it is that's i'm I'm i I won't i won't i won't disagree and like this isn't a conversation of like like respecting you know the men's game you, you, I, any less uh than the, it's not the about respecting game. the men's game it's just that nobody respects the vla because we don't have any money but that's okay yeah I, i'm i'm okay with that but i mean uh, amongst but, men's volleyball it seems that like like it, it does seem to me like the vla is more respected than your neighbors or your, yeah. your competitors that's yeah that that's a low bar you know like was with <laughs> within within the men's game like the fact that you have uh, 60 teams within within the organization is a testament that you are the premier league in like i i think i i, I don't not, i don't think there's any doubt to that any no longer, there's not in, in in my opinion yeah eight to uh, eight men's tier one three tier two and 13 women's yeah and just so you know if anyone from canada tries the, a team in the vla the first text a uh, first person rob texts <laughs> is me and I, I and i will be i i will i will be doing doing some research it's 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 not a great look, to be honest, if I don't know your name. <laughs> yeah, we've had a couple uh, a couple feelers put out in the last couple of years by potential Canadian teams, and I always run those names when they when they email us or DM us or whatever. I always yeah. run those names by Everett, and uh, it's very rarely met with a positive reaction. <laughs> there was one I did I did uh, give you uh, a thumbs up um, for one team. But I'm not going to give them any shout outs because they all ended up flaking and, and not not going to the tournament and pulling they out did. At, the last sec- at the last second. They did do so that. no shout out for you. You know who you are. And I expect <laughs> better of you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, I think that's a show. It, it's a plenty long show. I'm, I'm thrilled that my hotel internet connection here in Kansas City has mostly held up. I'm sorry if I cut out at times and I didn't even know it. But uh, thank you guys for watching. It's going to be a big week of volleyball. Champions League tomorrow. Bunch of yep. ball over the weekend. And, Keep, uh, yeah, tomorrow and on Friday too. Uh, it's mm-hmm. going to be a later one because it's coming in from San Diego. So might not stay up for that one. Um, but yeah, big, 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 big weekend of ball. Yep. Have a, Thanks have, for watching, have a people. One, ladies and gentlemen.
That's right. Make sure you subscribe to Volleyball Source. It'd be crazy if you hadn't already done that. Um, beat the buzzer here before the end of the show. Give us a thumbs up on the video. We've had a lot of you watch. That's awesome. Our, um, we, we love our community. Hit us with a thumbs up on the video and uh, make sure you join the Volleyball Source Discord. Links in the description. It's the best community in, in all of online volleyball and it's not close. So get in there. Uh, it's a great resource and uh, we'll see you in there as we talk about all these matches this week. I just saw the biggest, one of the biggest blocks on my life from oh, yeah? these sports this past weekend. Oh, Jonas Van Heusen. Oh my goodness. Let's see uh, it. Let's see it. Put it up on screen. Okay, wait. It's, it's, it's like right. Let's see it. Oh, that's filthy. That's whoa. filthy. From, whoa, whoa, from, from whoa. the University of Fraser Valley there on, uh, on Sask. Whoa! That was, I know the that game went, went went to Sask, but whoo-hoo, that was filthy by Van Heusen. All that right. Peace out, everyone. We love you all. Uh, join us on the Discord. I've been having lots of fights on the Discord in a fun way uh, recently, so <laughs> so come, uh, come, come take some licks for me. All right. Peace. We love you all. Bye. Love you guys.